Hello and welcome to Bangalore International Centre's very own podcast, BIC Talks. Bangalore International Centre is a platform for informed conversations, exchange of ideas and a space for arts and culture. BIC Talks brings the essence of all that the physical space stands for and more to your doorstep. Hi, I'm Pavan Srinath and welcome to BIC Talks. As we enter a new normal in 2020, the idea of any travel and any exploration of the natural wonder of India is quite difficult to grasp. Today, instead of getting out on the road, we take a virtual audio tour of India's natural history, its deep past and biodiversity. And to help us do that, we have Pranay Lal, who returns to BIC Talks. Pranay is a biochemist who works on the public health and the environment. And he is also the author of Indica, A Deep History of the Indian Subcontinent, which is a masterful work, one where Pranay brings geology, geography, prehistory, biodiversity, everything to life. Pranay, welcome back to BIC Talks. Thank you for having me again, Pavan. The pleasure is entirely ours. I want to start off by asking, what is it that makes India's landscape so diverse? In your book, you describe some of the oldest rocks in the world in India and some of the youngest as well. What is it that makes our landmass so unique? I think just about everything about India is very, very interesting and unique. You know, we've got rocks which compare with the world's oldest rocks. There's always this dating game that is happening. When I mean mean dating, I mean uh, dating using radioactive elements to match uh, which rocks across the world's oldest landmasses are truly the oldest ones. Until quite recently, our understanding was that oldest part of India's landmass was the Dharwad Craton. You know, it's named after the town of Dharwad in Karnataka. And that is still true to some extent, because as a Landmass, it is large, it's a huge provenance of solid single rock. And that's about 3.2 to 3.3 billion years old. But there's a small plateau that has been discovered. It actually, in comparison to Dharwad, it looks like a singular rock. It was discovered near Kurg. And this was dated to be older than the crew provenance. And I think this is what makes it fascinating that, you know, every few years we recalibrate our time and we come to an understanding that some of them are younger or some of them are even older than what we had previously believed. Our understanding of this rock that is discovered in the Kurg area is interesting because it has reset the, the understanding of geologists and people who study old land masses or how they came to exist is that they find that you know this is an alien block of rock that has come and annealed itself it's come and stuck itself to this larger land mass of the dharwal craton now as you know the word craton is used in a term that you know it's something that has been a very very old land mass it's a piece of rock largely made from a single geologic event it consists of suites of rocks which are very similar. There would be some tinkering that has happened over the next billion years or so, but largely the rocks look very related. This rock, the one that I'm talking about in Kurg, is slightly different. If you were to go to Google Maps or even to a geological map, you would realize that you know there is just one small speck uh, on that map that actually stands out and it actually eluded geologists when they were actually working on this. The dating had never taken place for this particular mountain plateau that just uh, sticks out. So they found that the date uh, of this rock is is much older than the one that uh, has been discovered for, for Dharwar and different parts of Dharwar actually. So even the Dharwar Craton, when you talk about 3.5 billion years old, that's half the age of the sun. So the idea that we can walk on something that is half the age of the sun itself is quite astounding, right? And now you're talking that there is some part in Kurg which we can probably drive down to perhaps once the pandemic is over, once the lockdown and other things are over and it's safe again. And it just boggles my mind. Billions of years is not something that humans can conceive of, right? I mean, even a hundred years is very difficult to imagine. 
imagine. I agree. But you know, there are older things than this as well. And you know, there are small specks of glass shards, which are called zircon, which can be older. They can be anything between 4.5 to 4 billion years old. And these have been found in various parts of the world, most commonly in Western Australia. And there's a meteorite, which is in the National Museum of Scotland, which is dated at 4.5 billion years old, which is as old as Earth itself. Although it did not fall on Earth 4.5 billion years ago, it traveled all around the universe and fell only a couple of centuries ago. That's a fascinating piece of meteorite. And when the dating happened, we meteorite specialists found that about 4.5 billion years old. So yeah, it is incredible that we find things that have freshly come to our view, but are actually been there or have witnessed processes of the universe for far longer than we had envisaged. I think that, to me, makes a baffling story. Wow. So here, the Dharwar Craton that you mentioned, is it a gigantic amount of granite that sort of underlies much of Karnataka, much of Bangalore and other areas as well? So instead of uh, lava that comes to the surface, is this sort of magma that solidified before it reached the surface? Is that sort of the simple takeaway from this? You're quite right. Actually, the whole process is interesting. And I think geologists and rock scientists are coming to understand, or at least imagining how that process would have started. And when I try talking to young people, I say that, listen, you know, imagine the earth to be like a hot bowl of soup that has been brought to you. Imagine that you've been given croutons, you know, those bread uh, square cubes of bread that have been slightly toasted with butter. And the hot red tomato soup is actually the magma that is the molten earth. And to it now, if you were to just add a few croutons, those would be the rocks that have been formed because blobs have come from the magma that have uh, annealed together. And for a very short time, they stay on the surface and then they get pulled down again. And this process, the cycle of the crouton coming up and sinking again when it becomes heavy is the earliest form of rock that actually formed. And this was around 4 billion years ago, or even earlier, actually, about 4.2 billion years ago. And it's only later, and this rock is actually not granite yet. It's basalt. This is the thing that makes the interior of the volcano, the lava, right, before it comes out. And it's lava when it is repeatedly heated again and again. And when the crystals start to grow, that's when you start getting granite. And so that process of heating and reheating the the basalt under the surface of that hot soup, and as the soup cools, it creates the croutons to form a little lumps which stick together to form the first rocks. So that's how the earliest rocks perhaps got created. And as they bobbed up and floated on the magma, because uh, the blobs, as you know, the croutons are lighter, right? Although they might be more solid than the magma itself or the, or the soup in this case, they actually tend to float. And this is when the first ancient granite or granite like other rocks that came to exist began to float on a sea of magma. So imagine it to be a bit like that. This whole process is something that we have only begun to understand now. In fact, the whole cycle of elements and how the elements formed minerals and how the minerals became a little more complex is a story by itself. And that is a trajectory that follows the birth of Earth. And as new elements are added to the Earth's surface, it also contributes to evolution of life and complexity of life. So I think there are intrinsic things that are linked together on the surface of the earth and also more importantly in the deep processes of what's happening beneath the earth's surface which actually drive the evolution of minerals and water together have this profound impact on how life evolves in the future. Just like you mentioned some of these oldest rocks, can you also share some of your favorite examples from your various travels of some of the youngest and other sediments and other rocks that you have come across across the country? So, Pavan, this is a large, expansive debate. And it's something that as it progresses, and if you were to put various geologists and paleontologists and others in the room, you would have slightly differing views beyond a point. But, you know, this is my take on how possibly landmass of India came together. The oldest rocks, of course, were the ones that assembled around Dharwar. And they were blocks that kept 
getting added to them as they stabilized. And there were some of these were borrowed from Antarctica and Australia. And so there's, there's that relationship between these land masses and how they eventually broke off at different periods of time until 100 million years ago. We were closely attached to several of these. So new land masses are created and as they stabilize, they leave traces behind in forms of hills and valleys and plateaus and relic environments as well. And several of these are the ones that still are with us. And some of these have got layered in forms of rock that has been built over other rock, which again is truly interesting concept for us because we find traces of life in them. So let's go into a very quick Winzib journey from Dharwar, which is the oldest. You had then the other parts of the southern peninsula, you know, the tip Nagar Coil and Kadalore and Salem block got added. And then you had the Singhbhum crater in which you have Chhattisgarh and uh, Jharkh and then a bit of Bengal and Orissa rest today. And then you have the Bundel Khand Craton that is slightly north and wedges between Chhattisgarh, Bastar Craton and the Singhbhum Craton. And slightly west to that is the Bundel Khand Craton. And soon after the Singhbhum Crater got created and the Bundel Khand Craton got created, you have the Craton on which the Aravali is resting called the Marwar Craton. So you have these geologic frameworks that are created. It's like the basement rock upon which all future rocks and hills and mountains and everything else would rest. So after that, if you can say in terms of a body plan, a framework was created. You have new rocks that are constantly being built over these. Now, of course, when I say constantly, I'm staying half a billion years or 100 million years or, you know, those kind of things in huge expanse of time. But... All these are before us. But to cut the long story short, you've had rocks being built over one another. Many of them stay preserved. And you have traces of life. You have traces of other geologic events. For example, a meteorite crashing in some other corner of the world. But, you know, because of the blowout and because of the impact that has had, the cloud or the ash from all these cataclysmic events... Actually, the traces come and land in some layer in India or anywhere else in the world. And that's what makes everything even more interesting because you get a constant influx of minerals and traces of geologic events, cataclysmic events that leave behind traces of what would have happened several billion years ago or even 100 million years ago, or even a couple of million years ago. In fact, there's a very, very nice ash bed in Western Orissa, which actually is the volcanic event which triggered the out-of-Africa movement of our ancestors from Africa to India and West Asia. And that volcanic event caused the, the sudden cooling of the planet. And as a result, Eastern Africa began to dry out. And there was no option for our ancestor, the earliest Homo sapiens, to leave Africa and seek new lands. And they eventually arrived into India. But, you know, there are layers of volcanic ash, what is called tephras, and they are available in Western Orissa. And you could see them. They're beautiful. In fact, they were used from Andhra and Western Orissa. They were used to make porcelain cups. The first porcelain cups that were made by East India Company men was from these beautiful white fine powder that was found in these layers. And you're talking about the Toba catastrophe? Yes, I'm talking about Toba, yeah. So this is a 75,000 or so years old event and... It's about 74,600 is what paleoanthropologists and volcanologists uh, put this at. And that was also used to make porcelain a couple of hundred years ago. The timescales and the intertwining is just incredible. Early morning when you wake up and make your cup of tea, and I can be certain that 80% of India's homes today have a, a granite counter or a stone slab. And you know, chances are that that stone slab that is on your kitchen counter is about 2 billion years old or thereabouts. It depends from where the slabs come because most often it is what is called the kota stone or the kadappa stones. And those are the lovely polished slabs that we use in our kitchens. And those are 2 billion years old. So you know, every morning You are introduced even before you begin your day. It begins with something that you make contact with two billion year old history. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) I mean, that just changes the perspective on so many things and how we can be looking at them. Pranay, given that there's this amazing geological history and we see 
sort of all of it here in our Indian subcontinent as well. How does this get linked to life and the immense biodiversity that we see in this? You gave us hints of this, but could you tell us a few examples of this relation between the geology and the biodiversity? So I spoke about how minerals evolved, right? I mean, I did not actually take you to the geological history of how the minerals came to exist. I think even that's work in progress. But you know, what has happened is that the evolution of minerals and the evolution of first life is very closely related. And we know that once the first cellular organisms began to colonize first the sea and then the edge of water, there was copious amount of oxygen that started to also emerge. Oxygen added immense amount of oxygen to the atmosphere, obviously. And what that did was it started to create the first oxides. And, you know, from having around a thousand minerals, we had another 4,000 minerals. So in all, today we have the same number of minerals as the same number of mammals that exist in the world. So about 5,600 minerals as it's been listed in the American Mineralogical Society. We know that minerals have evolved because of this biological event that happened in which oxygen was added in huge amounts. Now, that aside, what has happened is that the birth of the oxygen producing and oxygen consuming creatures that what we call photoautotrophs, the cyanobacteria, the blue green algae, the free living bacteria, these have contributed, you know, immensely to the evolution and, you know, the ones that have actually driven the evolutionary process on earth. And it's something that we don't appreciate enough. It's looking at these small creatures uh, that even today play a very, very vital role in terms of evolution. I think the force behind the evolutionary process in terms of, of course, other than the effect of the sun and plate tectonics. By plate tectonics, what I mean is the way the land masses have moved and the shapes of ocean and the position of land masses vis-a-vis -vis the equator and the latitudes also make a, a profound impact. And of course, there are viruses who do constant genetic transfer between organisms. That's, of course, the very critical thing. But you know, the underlying force for the evolution of macro life and how species themselves evolved into smaller and varied types, you know, build in smaller variations. Plants have a tremendous role in that process as well, because that's what distinguishes between the diets that you're going to have. Especially if you were to look at the evolution of the earliest life forms, if you were to look at, say, elephants and rhinoceros, it was dependent on not just shrubs and trees and climbers, but also the grasses. And I think this is something that we need to understand in terms of the longer processes that come into play when evolution is discussed. And the moment we start talking about our flora in this way, our vegetation in this way, that forms a very direct link with the geology and the soil and everything else as well, right? Because you need that along with the climatic conditions to establish those plants and to allow them to exist. And then you have the animals who can feed on them. And then you build up the big animal life cycle and the chain over there. Absolutely. But the process is both ways. So the first climate change that was caused in terms of a life giving organism or a life form were these humble creatures called stromatolites. Now stromatolites are basically bacterial mats, you know, blue green algae and bacteria that together form complex colonies. They are partnership between three or four free living organisms, but they depend on each other for a few minerals. And that exchange creates these mats. They like to live in close contact and they form these beautiful layers and they are now fossilized and they look like rocks. In fact, some of them are even used to make fertilizer or to, they are now by and large extinct. I mean, they are only found in few patches, you know, a pool in, in Australia or in the Caribbean or some places like that. But their utility function in terms of the larger scheme of things has diminished. But that's possibly not the only reason why they have vanished from the face of the earth or they are so marginalized in terms of their prevalence. It's possibly because complex organisms that benefited from the oxygen that stromatolite provided made the life so complex that organisms began to feed on 
these bacterial mats and it became easier for them to actually forage on them. For example, crabs and, you know, mollusks and sea snails and slugs. And so what would perhaps would have happened is as more life forms evolved, things that had actually been the template for creation of complex life began to erode or began to diminish. So that's possibly been one of the reasons why the creature that I'm talking about, the stromatolite, has actually got marginalized. But what the point that I'm trying to make is that stromatolite added so much oxygen between you know 2.8 billion years to 500 million years. The earliest global freezing was orchestrated by these creatures. And this is something that we have never appreciated. And you have evidence of the last global ice fields that had happened in, uh, in Chitradurga. And the, the beginning of the last phase was in Chitradurga. I mean, you have rocks that actually show the movement of glaciers from Chitradurga towards its nearest sea. And there's also very interesting ice fields that are in the middle of the Thar Desert or even near Ranchi, near a coal mine in Talcher, near Orissa. You, you find the evidence of marine incursion and a glacier that's about to float and dropping these rounded stones, what are called drop stones. And all these beautiful landscapes of the past are in peril. And I think that's where the whole problem is. And just to make this point a little more interesting, it's not just that the plants and the microbes that have forced the course of evolution. Sometimes the large creatures also make a very, very profound impact, but it's largely on one another. I mean, for example, we know that in the age of the mammals, when the giant mammals ruled the world, or at least the land, I'm talking about a period between 38 and 19 million years ago. So the dominant creature, land creature, were the rhinoceros and not the others in terms of the herbivores, right? I mean, even today, if you were to look at the, the real king of the jungle is actually not the tiger or the lion. It's possibly the elephant, at least in, the, in South Asia region. So the elephant or the gore, I mean, these are, these are very powerful animals and they actually shape the nature of the forest, right? Or the grasslands. And this is exactly what was happening even in olden times. And there is evidence now that... It was the rise of the elephants because elephants began to start feeding on grass and deliberately started to uproot or stunt the trees upon which the rhinoceros depended. And as a result, the giant rhinoceroses are the ones that began to perish because, of course, there was also global cooling, which caused stunting of trees. That was, of course, the final blow. But the elephants by this time had evolved to be more cosmopolitan. They began to not only feed on the treetops or the shrubs, but also began to feed on grasses, something that the rhinos of the time had not done. So that is a story that means that the elephants forced the giant rhinoceros to eventually shrink down to the size that they are today. So I think that's what the fossil record tells us. Pranay, I'm still trying to process all the many things that you dropped. First of all, glaciers in Chitradurga is something that is so difficult to imagine. But I'm guessing this is also at a time where the Indian landmass was not located where it is right now, which is, you know, in the tropics, close to the equator, but perhaps somewhere else. And clearly the global conditions and the temperature conditions were also very different. I'm still wowed by that and I'm also wowed by the fact that from what you mentioned about these stromatolites, you know, ancient, I'm guessing these were like precursors or the earliest lichen form organisms that existed and something like lichens which were fundamentally changing not just the climate but the very atmosphere and the very uh, biosphere in fundamental ways, in a sense puts our own human actions in a different perspective, right? It doesn't give us a pass or an excuse in climate change but it sort of tells us that it doesn't take only human hubris and excess to change the world. Life as it has evolved over the last several billions of years has changed the world as we know it, both at the small scale, you know, both in one ecosystem, like with elephants and rhinos, and perhaps the entire world as well. I think the intervention of humans in terms of shaping landscapes or, you know, just taking a few days or months to devastate an entire forest or put a road across it or dam it or whatever, you know, those, so those kind of massive changes that uh, humans can bring is something that ecological actors uh, will not be able to cope up with, whether it's a forest by itself or the residents of the forest or a grassland for that matter. So I think you use just the right term, it's human hubris. 
And what is credible is that we do this at our own peril because we won't be able to reverse much of this. I mean, we might be able to open up the dam, but you know, the creatures that have gone missing that used to actually stabilize the river system or the pond systems and you know, whatever that existed along that ecological system are now gone. And restoring that would take several hundred, several thousand years, if, if not. And what you're saying is organisms that life forms and others, the processes that perhaps took millions of years, hundreds of millions of years, we are perhaps able to do in one lifetime. And that's what is truly terrifying. Not just that, I think what is also happening is that we are leaving behind more permanent impressions and fingerprints that are irreversible. The point that I'm making here is that, you know, there are chemicals, for example, that we are leaving behind in ecosystems that will take 100 years or even 100,000 years for them to decompose. And what they do is they alter the chemistry, the geochemistry and the microbial chemistry and the relationship between microbes and roots. And therefore, the impacts are very, very large. And this is something that we are only beginning to understand now. But again, we don't put the whole picture before us to understand how changing one very small part of an equation is going to have a larger impact to the world. And like I spoke with you earlier about prochlorococcus and, you know, the two organisms, prochlorococcus and synechococcus, which produce just about all the free oxygen that is available to the earth now, other than that of forest. So let me just break everybody's hearts here. Trees in the forest produce oxygen for themselves. Planting trees is very useful. I'm not being dismissive or I'm not being, uh, you know, lip, but it's the humble organisms that produce oxygen on a daily basis and they die in huge numbers. And as they die, they go and bury themselves or they get buried. Uh, they settle at the bottom of oceans and ponds and rivers and lakes. And that deep burial is something that causes the sinking of carbon. Now, this process has been compromised. And our efforts, largely in, say, climate change, are overdoing the what I call cosmetic, that, of course, saving the Amazon is important and the Western Ghats and everything. There's no doubt in my mind at all that we should not be saving them. But if we are looking at the ledger of where carbon and oxygen, if we were to mitigate the two and, you know, we want to balance the two, if we were to look at that, then I think organisms and geological processes have a very strong role to play. And this is something that we have not internalized in terms of our processes when we talk about how we want to mitigate climate change caused by us. So I think we need to put things in perspective. I don't think we've fully understood the processes that go behind climate change and who actually contributes to keeping that balance. We've looked at the macro things, but we forget the more humble things that are working in the background. And we just don't uh, appreciate them enough. I wanted to take a little detour and ask you about something else that you talk about in your book as well, about how India's deep past has influenced life in other parts of the world as well. And this is something that we completely miss in our discussions and in our thinking. Could you tell us a little more about this? Once India separated from its Gondwanan cousins, right? So, I mean, we were, as you know, attached with Antarctica and Australia to the east, you know, the east coast of India, what is currently the east coast of India was attached very closely with the western margin of Australia and the northwestern margin of Antarctica. And to our west, we were closely packed with uh, Madagascar and Africa. We share a lot of ancient creatures that exist, especially plants. But with about uh, 120 million years ago, starting 120 million years ago, these land masses began to go their separate way. I mean, the distance between them started to increase. There, there was a violent separation and series of volcanic events started to break away these continents from us. And Madagascar separated from India about 88 million years ago. And, you know, you have a very good evidence of a rock, which is found just off the coast of Mangalore. It's called Coconut Island, and they're beautiful red columns of basalt. You know, they're hexagonal, beautiful rocks. And you find something very similar on the east coast of Madagascar. So I think there's the evidence that if anybody asks you that, can you prove that India and Madagascar were attached to each other? Of course, a map would 
help you do that. And, you know, the course of rivers, for example, the rivers in Kerala and the rivers of southeast Madagascar actually line up quite closely to each other. But be that as it may, once the Gondwanan landmasses began to move on their own trajectories, I mean, the paths that they were taken by the sea creating new land under it, the landmasses began to move at their own very, very gradual pace. This is the time when dinosaurs ruled the world and mammals were very, very small, inconspicuous creatures. The flowering plants had just emerged and they were beginning to shape course of evolution. Uh, there were new creatures, uh, especially new types of beetles and butterflies and ants and wasps and other things that were coming to fore. But the larger creatures were yet to be impacted because dinosaurs on land were still the masters. But the extinction that was caused first by the decline of the dinosaurs by the Deccan volcanism, which started 60, 68 million years ago and lasted till about 66, 65 million years ago. And then the final death knell for the dinosaurs, the Chicxulub uh, meteor, that the asteroid that came and landed near Mexico, which actually killed all dinosaurs. That was the time which actually ended the dynasty of the dinosaurs. And that's the brilliant part of the story that how does evolution begin once the dominant creature, some the most successful land vertebrate to have ruled the land for over 170 million years, and suddenly it's suddenly gone, right? It had captured every space from skies to land, it ruled everything. And even the giant reptiles in, in the seas, you know, the Mosasaurus, the Ichthyosaurus, everything vanishes. So it was the old creatures, right? The sharks in the seas and the small, humble creatures, you know, the birds were the only remnants left behind by the dinosaurians, right? I'm taking a slightly longer detour here, but it's interesting because, you know, how did evolution begin across the world in terms of, you know, the new species that were beginning to emerge was, was an interesting time on, in Earth's history. The creatures that began to rest for control were the, the descendants of the dinosaurs, the birds. And the, the earliest birds were giant birds. And they were flightless. Most of them were flightless. And India became because it was in close contact with Antarctica. And paleontologists believe that the flightless birds emerged in Antarctica and that's how they hopped on to Australia and then also to, to New Zealand. A small batch also left for Madagascar and India. There is also flightless birds that left for South America and Africa. They perished first in South Africa and, and the African region. They survived quite well in Madagascar till very, very recently and in the Indian Ocean Islands as well. And, and the southern continents, I mean, Australia, New Zealand. The story that we haven't talked about and the one that you alluded to is that India had a fair share of flightless birds, at least one that we, were, we are very sure of. And it, in fact, lived for a very, very long time. In fact, they possibly perished only 11,000 years ago in terms of if the earliest Indians had encountered the ostrich, you know, the, the bird that I'm talking about is the ostrich. So India's gift to Africa was actually the ostrich. I mean, we've given them ostrich as a gift because it left India one, once India docked. So among the creatures that be, began to dominate after the dinosaurs perished were giant birds and there were land crocodiles, which were also in the fray to rule the land. Mammals were still very small and there were smaller reptiles which were scurrying around in the forest or open grasslands. But you know, what was critical was that the birds, the large flightless birds were very critical in the first few years after the death of the dinosaurs to actually try wreaking havoc on the other creatures to a until very recently uh, under the terror of uh, dinosaurs. So they were actually called terror birds. And, you know, in the, that was the term that was used by paleontologists because when the first discoveries of these giant birds was being made in the turn of the century, of the last century, 1900s, in South America, they found these very, very large skeletons of birds. Uh, they were called terror birds. So you had terror birds in South America and you had 
not as large, but large birds like elephant bird, which was uh, a large flightless bird from Madagascar. Uh, we've not found any form of remains of the elephant bird, although India and Madagascar were joined together. But there was another bird that flightless and large, and that was part of India's bevy of things, and that was the ostrich. So ostrich actually was... India's flightless bird and it traveled with India after India and Madagascar separated and it stayed with India till as recently as 11,000 years ago. So we have cave paintings and evidence from eggshells of made from ostrich eggs. Uh, they are made into beads because they are very durable. There have been also discoveries of ost uh, ostrich bones in Maharashtra and northern uh, Tamil Nadu and Andhra Pradesh and Madhya Pradesh. You know, actually right across, even in Himachal Pradesh, a lot of them have been discovered in uh, in Rajasthan where we've, uh, they've discovered beads made out of uh, ostrich uh, eggshells. So ostriches were in India then for, from what, 60, 80 million years, right? When we broke off from Madagascar till when humans arrived in coastal India. Yes, absolutely. I mean, they live within, with humans for uh, also uh, a, a very, very significant time because, see, the arrival of humans in India is around 60 to 58,000 years ago. You know, that's the estimated time when they arrived uh, on the banks of the Indus. And they would have certainly encountered the ostrich and they had encountered the ostrich in Africa because when India docked with Eurasia, the ostriches left westwards. They went, went across to Iran and from Iran into the Levant and Arabia and went into Africa. So, th so our human ancestors were aware of this bird. Uh, and they were aware of many other creatures like the elephants and other creatures that have been going in and out of Africa and Asia. So for them, this looked like a very familiar bird. And they would have, they would have found uh, similarities between Africa and India because, uh, you know, the, the sets of animals are very, very similar. The whole history is fascinating. In fact, there are some caves where there are depiction of large birds. And, uh, you know, anthropologists believe and, you know, rock painting experts believe that this could well be painting of an ostrich. And of course, we find very recent eggshells and in fact, in Maharashtra, in certain parts of Maharashtra, it was relatively easy to find eggshells of ostriches. So that's one story that I think is, is incredible, which we have not uh, told our, our children and our youngsters. And the second story was even more fascinating. It's like a Cinderella story. And that's the story of the whales. Whales began uh, as very, very small animals. They look like a small pygmy hog, what is called a uh, water shervotan. It's like those small musk deer shaped animals that were entirely herbivorous and they would actually duck into water to, to eat reeds and fresh water lettuce and things like that. This is the time when land masses were moving northwards, at least the southern continental, the, the Gondwan and land masses were beginning to approach uh, Europe or Eurasia. Australia was moving eastwards and Antarctica was moving southwards to rest into the place where they are today. And as that was beginning to happen, there was a lot of closing and opening of seas. And there was this massive sea between Shanghai, where Shanghai is today, Till the Straits of Gibraltar, which is the mouth of the uh, Mediterranean, you know, the, the gap between Spain and Morocco. So there was a sea, an ancient sea called the Tethys, which existed there. And this is the time when there was a lot of new innovative tinkering that was happening in the body plans of mammals. So in the summer of 1975, two Indian scientists in Kutch discovered small bones of an animal. So they were not sure what it was. And it looked as if it was a creature that looked very similar in terms of its bone structure to a cow. But it was entirely marine. And they were not sure what this was. And this is how it was discovered that, you know, these were bones of a very, very early whale. And uh, since then, they found uh, a series of bones of different species of whales, starting from that deer-like small creature, which was called indo hyas or indo India's pig. Indo is India and Hyas is pig. From that creature, how that 
animal began to become more spindle shaped and instead of a grazer became an omnivore and then then gradually specialized into either eating just meat like the orca the killer whales or the the dolphins and the porpoises or they ended up even diversifying to the other extreme and this is how we see the evolution of the the plankton eating the giant uh, blue whales and the others i mean in in a very short span of just 38 million years you had a creature that had never taken to water that was mammals becoming entirely water dependent you know as for the first time that you see a animal not leaving water and taking to land but leaving land to take take on to the water and not just to a river or to a lake but to oceans and then live their lives entirely in ocean absolutely and they they live in warm oceans as well as cold oceans and this kind of immense physiological change and seeing that happen in a span of just 38 million years is outstanding and you know the ancestors of the whales of course were slightly older i mean you could go back and find uh, older ones as well but you know the real true whales began to live exclusively in water around 38 million years and of course you had the older ancestors of the whale called for example the himal seeters which lived about 53.5 million years ago in the shimla and then there was nala seeters which because nala is in hindustani means a stream and it was discovered in in punjab the undivided punjab and both sides of the border then there were other species and you know from becoming completely herbivorous creature they became into slightly wolf sized bigger creatures with hair which was bit like an otter and they developed webbed hind feet that helped them propel in shallow waters but they were still not exclusive creatures of the water they still uh, lived around rivers and a bit like otters but more dependent on land for you know their breeding and mating purpose but it was quite late around you know 17 million years later that they become exclusively creatures of the water but they are still not true whales because they have features that are still very land mammal like and they shed these and they they begin to leave these physiological traces uh, behind only more recent so that to my mind is a story that is still under development but this immense discovery of the whales doing what they did from being completely living off the land becoming living on land and depending on water and then leaving land in its entirety and never to return is is a story which i think is outstanding and needs to be told and the australian national university and the victoria museum did a fascinating exhibition a couple of years ago and you know it's tragic that you know we haven't done this i mean there are very few evidence of whales from australia for that matter or even america or the british natural history museum i mean they don't have fossil records that we have but yet we've not done a single exhibition on how whales evolved in punjab or kutch or assam and you know the, all along the tethys this could have been a great opportunity for indian museums to showcase the great discoveries that have been made in india the idea that there is so much to celebrate so much to draw inspiration from that has happened in our own subcontinent in our own little corner of the world it's, it's truly tragic and that brings me to my sort of final broad question to you i mean there is this much history how do we start improving this natural history appreciation your book again makes a dramatic step forward for all of us making this accessible and not keeping this knowledge locked in an archaeology journal or a geology journal somewhere but accessible to most of us where do you think we lost it and how do you think we can bring back natural history appreciation pavan i think this pandemic is grim reminder that how we need to start looking at the world around us i think there's the first steps for all of us as we are a cooped into our homes is to start looking around our homes you know just go to our balconies or the windows or wherever we can look out just give a gaze to the tree or if you're lucky you see birds or whatever creatures you get to see just spare a moment to think about how they got there and you know how intrinsically they are linked to our lives it may appear to everyone that there is casual relationship that you hear a bird sing and that's it it tweets and flits and flies away but it's not so i think we now need to start understanding how 
the web of life is actually much more ingrained into our own lives and how intertwined it is with our own life. This is something that we need to start building as an appreciation among children. And, and I think it's never too late. I think even if uh, people begin to understand that, you know, why do rivers exist the way they do and how hills or mountains or soils and, you know, humble creatures have made an impact in our, on our lives. And I think everything has. We just can't feel morally superior or any other way superior for that matter. That, you know, we are not part of the animal world or the plant world or the natural world. We can't be standing alone outside and imagine that there is nature versus us. I think this is, you know, the, the simplest creature in the world has actually told us that we should find our place in the natural world. I think this is where it begins. So for me, natural history has always been a thing that builds perspective. And if you were to understand this bit, for example, 8% of your DNA is courtesy of viruses who have given this to you over several hundred thousand or perhaps millions of years and you share genes that are common to bacteria and to grasses and to mosses and everything that you tread upon so you know there are things that should bring in that sense of humility in just about every human being and it's only then that we start believing that we want to save the lakes of bangalore or the western ghat forests or the erosion that's happening as we speak in kerala or the flooding that's taking place in kolkata and around so i think we need to understand those processes and how they are something that humble us but at, at the same time we now need to build in an intrinsic value not only for their conservation, but for our own conservation, even if you want to be selfish in some way. I think if this were to happen, I think our scientists, if they were able to drive in some sense into our policymakers and bureaucrats and politicians and help them see things further and deeper. I think we would be able to make a more compassionate world. I think today we live in a world of violence with nature. I mean, you enter a home, you find pesticides all around you. You do everything to zap a flying insect. Of course, there are insects and other creatures that are there that can harm you. But trust me, it's 95% of all species of, say, even mosquitoes are not designed to bite you. I mean, they, they can't bite you because they don't have the mouth parts, right? And possibly they don't even exist in a place where, where humans live, right? Or or they were destined to live. So those are the kind of concerns that actually worry me in terms of why natural history is not currently being incorporated. And I think the idea of natural history being integrated, science and not don't tease out science saying that it's physics and chemistry and biochemistry or uh, biogeochemistry and geology and geography. This is splitting hair. I think we need to look at not just the single hair, but let's look at the entire braided knot of hair that actually puts together and makes an elegant story for us. And I think just by trying to tease out those things to you know go so much so deep into it while missing the big picture i think that is something that we need to work towards so i think for me there are three things that are critical one we need to be looking at how we want to foster learning in not just schools and colleges but also as we sit in boardrooms and seats of power or wherever we can make uh, important decisions i think we need to start de-schooling our education and we need to look at or uh, rather encourage critical thinking. I think we, uh, lots of people are working on different ways of schooling, encouraging critical thinking, but trying to teach critical thinking as at graduate level is not your idea of fostering education. Critical thinking and curiosity are something that happen at early age. And I think that's something that we should let the child keep and rather than it being a course, you know, I think that's fundamentally wrong. And the second thing that I would like to say is that, you know, let's all work together to, you know, break molds and reset mindsets because uh, just now we focus on very, very tiny aspects of, you know, the big picture and scientists themselves do not feel encouraged to step across the lab and talk to somebody else who's working on a similar area or even a similar microbe or, or a similar min mineral, but a different aspect, you know, and they just generally don't collaborate. And, you know, I think the collaborations have to be far across. I mean, I think a geographer needs to sit with a historian, with an epidemiologist, with, a, with somebody who studies uh, nutrition 
understand what happened during the great Bangalore famine, right? I mean, nobody talks about the Mysore famine of the 1880s, right? And how that shaped us and why did it happen? You know, was it a collection of El Nino years or was it because of devastation of locusts and a fungal disease or, you know, what were the contributing factors? We just have not pieced together that story. For me, that is disturbing. How can we progress further and try addressing grand challenges that we are creating for ourselves without having understood what happened in the past. That to me is important. And therefore I say we need to reset the mindset of everyone who thinks is an expert or, or not. I think we eternally need to be students and inquire and stay curious all the time. And the final point that I want to do is that, you know, the first thing that I think we could begin with is to curate museums. And I think Bangalore International Center has already started doing that. And you've been organizing fascinating exhibitions. And I congratulate the team behind it. But I think, you know, there's so many institutions in India and so many public spaces which can be opened up. I mean, why is it that we don't have museums of the Ganga or the Gondwana or Deccan or the Dharwar Kraton? I mean, can't we collect 20 slabs of granite and stromatolite and banded iron formations to show the evolution of rock and oxygen and the great cooling that the microorganisms and oxygen caused? I think that in a small room, I mean, as you approach your reception in a museum, could well be opened up and made into a small story. So I think you don't have to do Smithsonian's. I think everybody is waiting to do a British Museum or a Smithsonian or a Peabody. I don't think you need to do that. I think you need to do small things which are local, which keep people engaged and build that greater appreciation in the local population of what makes a city or their town or their river or anything that is around them so special. I think we need to start telling the stories that are local and let's not be interested in, you know, things that have been distant or they're physically distant. Uh, I think they are interesting as well. I mean, of course they're interesting, but in terms of getting people to become more curious, I think we need to start becoming a little more localized and starting at home. And I would encourage corporations and libraries and museums and institutions to come up with, uh, with plans, even no matter how small those open spaces, the public spaces are, you could create uh, with a few, a handful of rocks and charts and uh, posters, an uh, interesting story, an interesting narrative to get people to stay curious. And I think that's where I would encourage institutions and uh, corporations to go forward. Pranay, thank you so much for joining us again on BIC Talks and expanding our minds each time and feeding our curiosity. Pranay, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for listening in till the end. Please share this episode with a friend on social media, WhatsApp or anywhere else. It would mean the world to us. And in case you're listening via iTunes or Apple Podcasts, please leave us a rating and a review. Subscribe to BIC Talks on email or your favorite podcast app and don't miss out on future episodes. This episode of BIC Talks has Gaurav Krishna as our sound engineer with support from S. Sarvanaraj and Lekha Naidu. And the accompanying episode artwork was made by Chandni Venkataraman. Thank you for listening to this episode of BIC Talks. This podcast can be accessed on our website, bangaloreinternationalcenter.org, as well as on any of your favorite podcast platforms. Tune in for new episodes every week and do subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow our Facebook, Twitter and Instagram pages to stay informed on our latest updates.